uh, for 2022. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here um, and also to those of you who are joining through uh, the medium of the internet, um, uh, a very warm welcome to you as well. Um, just a few practical things before I hand over to Rosemary, who will introduce our illustrious speaker for this evening. Um, and um, it's just a, a few basic things. Um, if you need the toilets at any point, um, uh, if you can go out the back and just follow the signs all the way around the building, uh, uh, the, the toilets are, are through there. Um, we are not expecting a fire alarm uh, to go off this evening. Um, so if it does, then um, if you can head out towards the gates um, at the uh, by the high street, that's the assembly point, um, and make your way speedily out. Um, and uh, other than that, um, if you could switch off uh, mobile phones uh, now, uh, just to prevent embarrassment for yourself as much as uh, uh, anyone else. But uh, I think uh, those are the uh, the only other announcements uh, that we have. Um, we are due to finish uh, around about 9 o'clock um, this evening. There will be the opportunity to ask uh, questions um, as part of the process. Um, if you can make them questions, ideally. Um, and brevity uh, is rewarded. Uh, in the questions uh, that, that you offer as well. So, um, but other than that, um, I think I'm done for this evening. A very warm welcome to you. Um, and uh, we will have another lecture next month as well. So we're going to hand over to Rosemary. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you. Uh, well, friends, it's a great pleasure to welcome as our speaker, Lynn Broadbent. Lynn has had a, a distinguished and varied career in both classroom teaching and academic university education, um, including being a lecturer at Christchurch here and at Goldsmiths College, and being the director of the National RE Centre at Brunel University. Lynn has been an external examiner for various BA, PGCE and MA academic courses and a consultant inspector for two London LEAs. She's been involved with the standing advisory committees in RE and inspections of church schools and is also a trained Ofsted inspector. What's so fascinating to see, I think, is that if you look at the uh, articles and journals and books the academic ones that Lynn has contributed to, you then also find that she has been responsible for creating um, resources for the classroom, very creative resources for the classroom, and at the skill of actually combining the, the study of pedagogy with producing resources which will stimulate young people to think about RE as looking into the meaning and purpose of life is a very significant skill to be able to combine the two. So Lynn, we're looking forward very much to what you've got to say to us. Lynn is currently the chair of the Canterbury and District Interfaith Action Group. And who else would be better to talk to us about the, the opportunities and the challenges of um, interfaith dialogue? Thank you, Lynn. We recognize that Britain is now a pluralist society of varied races, cultures, and religions. We must respect those who practice different religions and adhere to different styles of life. A more varied society offers new opportunities to us all. So by 1977, 
we were already a pluralist society, but this statement asks for respect for all, regardless of their faith background and practice. Now, about 20 years, give or take a few years later, summing up the religious prospects for the third millennium, the theologian Hans Kung wrote the following. No peace among the nations without peace among the religions. No peace among the religions without dialogue between the religions. So interreligious, interfaith dialogue is crucial for a peaceful world. And about, again, 20 years later, speaking on Thought for the Day, Radio 4's Thought for the Day, in November 2018, and that's when we have Interfaith Week, the late rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, said, we are enlarged by our differences. And on another occasion, he added this phrase, it's the people not like us that makes us grow. In the light of these statements, I'd like to consider, first of all, what we mean by interfaith dialogue, and equally, what we don't mean by it, to put some boundaries around the term. And secondly, I want to look at the context, both locally and nationally, within which dialogue takes place, and to look at some examples of interfaith activities which take place in Canterbury and nationally. And thirdly then, there are sometimes challenges for us when we engage in interfaith dialogue, and we'll mention those. First then, what is and what isn't interfaith dialogue? Essentially, it's about building relationships and building relationships within our local and our regional community. Relationships will be with people from different faith backgrounds than we come from. And in Canterbury, that might include Buddhists, Baha'is, Christians of different denominations, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, members of the humanist and pagan communities, and Sikhs. So there are many differences between us. But what we all share in common is the experience of being human, with its tribulations, its challenges, and its joys. Now, religion is not marginal to those relationships. It's central to each individual's sense of identity. It influences the decisions we make about our personal lifestyle. It can influence the work that you do, the food that you eat. But certainly, our religious and background actually affects the moral decisions that we make. In the practice of dialogue, you need other people in conversation. It's not religions that dialogue with each other, it's people. People who open up and get to know each other better. And when people do this, they learn about religion in everyday life, in the real world. It's not just a theoretical version from a textbook. And dialogue takes place in different contexts. It can be a dialogue just between two different religions. For instance, Christian and Muslim dialogue, or Christian and Jewish dialogue. And of course, that was the Council of Christians and Jews, uh, which started in 1942. It could be dialogue with much a larger number of religions uh, present, and some interfaith groups uh, in the UK do have a much larger group. We have more than just two faiths involved in our Canterbury group. But it might be women engaged in dialogue, as in the group Women of Faith and of None, 
which has met regularly in Canterbury for many years. Dialogue is about speaking, but it's also about listening. And it's listening and waiting to hear what the other has to say, not just listening until you can think of the next thing that you want to say. Patience is important. So, what then is the vision of a community with interfaith dialogue at its heart? And I think we have an, another overhead here. Yeah, good. We have a vision. In March, um, the Interfaith Network for the UK, the which is a national forum for interfaith work, um, held a one-day Zoom meeting, and it was entitled Working in Partnership for the Common Good. And the vision for the day was this one. Our vision is of a society where there is understanding of the diversity and richness of the faith communities in the UK and the contribution that they make. And where we live and work together with mutual respect and shared commitment to the common good. So living together and working together with mutual respect and a shared commitment to the common good. How does it happen? In his book, The Home We Build Together, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs used two phrases. He, one was face to face, the second side by side, to describe two types of interfaith action. Face to face is leading people to a better understanding of one another and celebrating those values that we have in common. Side by side involves people working together, rolling up your, the sleeves and getting stuck in to bring positive change to their local community through action. But I'll come back to those two phrases in a moment because I want to look at a phrase that was used before Jonathan Sachs used face-to-face -face and side-by-side. -side. We used to speak of different cultural and religious groups living parallel lives. So the different cultures, the different religions got on with their own lives, but in parallel with each other, there was no sense of really coming together in community. Some time ago, I was invited to speak at a conference in Germany. It was set up by the church due to a considerable concern that there was little sense of real community in the region. The different religious groups were living these parallel lives and the church believed that there, something should be done to address this, starting with the situation in schools. The conference was for teachers, education advisors, social workers, and members of the clergy. And I was to speak about how we addressed different religions and cultures in Britain. Now, at first, the participants were very receptive to looking at some of the things that we did in Britain. For instance, the number of languages that are used in many British schools and how in the reception area of schools, we had large posters saying welcoming in all these different languages. Another thing that we had in Britain was for younger children, dual language texts. So some of them were Spanish and English, and the stories were in these different, both languages, or maybe Urdu and English as well. And in the secondary sector, there were textbooks, but at different language levels to help people for whom English wasn't their first language. Now, they liked these suggestions. But when it came to talking about how we addressed religions in schools, 
and showing the sort of materials that we use, clips of DVDs on Sikh, Hindu, Muslim families celebrating together in their homes. The atmosphere completely changed and it was very much hands off. There were comments like, you can't teach about Hinduism because you're not Hindu. You can't teach about Sikhism, you're not Sikh and you're not Muslim, and so on. And yet teachers in British schools every day were doing just this, teaching and helping the pupils in schools to understand different religious perspectives. Now that evening, students from the local secondary school, the local gymnasium, enacted a series of role plays to express how they felt about the community in which they lived, about their education, and also about their aspirations in life. And the role plays were truly shocking because they spoke about feeling demoralized and alienated from the society in which they lived. It was staggering to them that their home lives were of no interest whatsoever to those in whose care they spent the bulk of their days. And when it came to talking about or enacting their aspirations in life, the aspirations were very low. Now, each religious and belief tradition speaks about relationships with others and how we might live together. They might do this through the lives and teachings of the key figures or through the ethical teaching of the faith or belief group. Variations, for example, on the golden rule. But I don't think that any religion suggests that remotely acceptable that communities within the wider community are alienated or demoralized. So building a community face to face and side by side, building community through interfaith dialogue and action. Well, face to face is learning about each other. It could be done formally. Individuals from different faiths could be uh, invited to a church or a meeting to talk about their religion and their home life. Or it could be informally through a picnic or a walk in the woods. Side by side is engaging alongside others on community-based tasks. And so here we need to look at Candifa, our interfaith group here in Canterbury, and how we actually work with those two phrases, face to face and side by side. Canterbury and District Interfaith Action dates from the year 2000. It was founded by Mike Walling and Arthur Weinberg, Mike being chair until 2019, and Arthur being vice chair until 2021. Now, one focus for Interfaith Activity is Interfaith Week. Interfaith Week is a na national week of celebration, and it begins each year on Remembrance Sunday. The aim for the week is encompassed in the vision that you saw earlier. It's about building society where we can live together with mutual respect and shared commitment to the common good. Before lockdown, Candifer celebrated the week with art exhibitions. There were two years in which we had this, uh, one in Concord House and one in St. Peter's uh, Church opposite here. And we had ex artworks from local artists who were inspired by their religious and spiritual beliefs. And these included some very beautiful icons. 
We also had a couple of sessions in, over the previous years of chanting from the faiths, with presentations on chanting in the Christian Orthodox tradition. We had demonstrations of chanting in the Buddhist community from the Krishna consciousness. You, some people may refer to these as the Hare Krishna movement from the Baha'i community, and who knew that the Baha'is actually are, have some very beautiful singing and chanting, and from the Muslim community with young children singing, and the call to prayer as it's given in different parts of the Muslim world. For several years, we've had a walk in the woods, actually Bleen Woods, with stops for readings about the natural world from different faith traditions. And last year, we instituted a new tradition with a picnic in the park. We had no readings this time, um, but it was great to be able to meet face to face after months on Zoom. We also held a Zoom forum, and this was based on the Jewish concept of Tikkun Olam, repairing the world. The idea that anyone, a child, an adult, an environmentalist, or an industrialist, can engage in an act, however small, of social justice and make a contribution to repairing the world. The forum included four speakers from the humanist, the Christian, Buddhist, and pagan traditions, each offering their own perspectives on the themes. And the videos of each, of each of these presentations is on our website, and anyone can go on that and actually check it out. On alternate Monday meetings, rather, on alternate meetings, we have members of Candifa speaking about their own faith or belief. And these two are recorded and go on our website as a way of actually uh, being a resource that anyone can go on and see the different faith traditions represented in Canterbury. We've had meetings on eco issues and the si on single use plastics, both in places of worship and in co on community events. During lockdown, most places of worship have been engaged with food banks and the Muslim community up at the university, along with others, has provided hot meals for key workers and encouraged the take-up of vaccinations among its community. Each year, Candifer takes part in the United Nations Association Service for Peace in the cathedral. And it's important to note that as the different organizations process down the nave with their banners, that these are from so many different faith and belief groups, so many differences between them, and yet so many areas of shared values. Similarly, on Holocaust Memorial Day, we join together in the service in the cathedral where the rabbi from the Ramsgate Synagogue recites the mourner's Kaddish, and our Muslim uh, representative takes part in the prayers. In the past, we've celebrated with the Baha'i community to mark the birth of the Bab, and with the Krishna consciousness movement, the Hare Krishna movement, on its peace walks. These have been quite amazing events where two very, very large bullocks process down the high street and they have uh, pull a chariot with an image of Krishna on it um, and go down Mercery Lane and into the butter market um, where there is chanting and dancing. That's a sight I never expected to see in Canterbury. So to date, interfaith dialogue has fostered a sense of community through engaging with all those faith and belief communities which make up the one Canterbury community. Learning about each other formally and informally and becoming involved in social action. It's been educative and it's been fun 
But what about those times of challenge when the communities have needed to come together to support each other? In 2019, there was an attack on the Muslim community in New Zealand. And the Imam at the mosque at the time invited us and the wider Canterbury community to join with the Muslim community for the Friday Jummah prayers, which were held that week in the open air at the university as an act of solidarity. Now, many, I would say between 50 and 100 people from Canterbury attended. It was a very moving occasion, observing the prayers and listening to speeches of support. Not long after this event, there was an attack elsewhere in the world on the Christian community. And this time, the Imam, with some members of the Muslim community, quite spontaneously took flowers to the cathedral service on the Sunday morning to show their solidarity with the Christian community at their loss. And I think they also came here to the Methodist church with flowers to here as well. And it's at times like this that it's hard not to be reminded of the words of Pastor Nimola. First they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists and the trade unionists, and the words conclude with, and then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Building community through interfaith dialogue and support. Having focus on the events and activities which have taken place in Canterbury, I just want to highlight a couple of uh, actions that have taken place by other interfaith groups in the UK. Groups that are working in partnership with other organisations. And these events were reported at the meeting I referred to in March. First, as I said, Interfaith Week is always marked in November, coinciding with Remembrance Sunday. And at a recent meeting, the Royal British Legion spoke about building community ties through a theme of remembrance. And they had this as a slogan, Remembrance is personal. Everyone has a story to tell. This new project with the Royal British Legion was supported by representatives from the Swami Narayan Temple in Neesden, so the Hindus, and Sheikh Osman from the Coventry community, uh, again a Muslim, who affirmed this action and described, each described themselves as people of peace. Another report came from Interfaith Scotland, who are very active in the interfaith work that they do. And they spoke on their latest project was, which is, multi-faith social action for the well-being of refugees and asylum seekers. And they had spoke about two parts of this project. One, which was challenging negative images in the media, negative images of asylum seekers and refugees. And secondly, having, they have a, a weekend club where refugees and asylum seekers could join local families for trips out into the country, say for a walk and a cup of tea or a picnic. Such simple experiences, but those which they would otherwise not have access to. A third report was from a group, or two groups, in Manchester and Birmingham. 
and they were fostering this sense of community through sporting activities. They were linking members of different faith communities through cricket and badminton clubs. And I think when they linked uh, members of the Asian community with the cricket club, one young woman actually was going, went on to play for the local county team. So it was a success story. I have to say that I was relieved that they uh, said that they also organized gentle walks for oldies, <laughs> culminating in coffee and cake at different places of worship. Those are just three examples, and there are lots more. There's one further context for interfaith dialogue, and this is scriptural reasoning. Can we go on to that? Thank you. Now, this has been um, largely organized um, by the theologian Professor David Ford from the Cam Cambridge Interfaith Group. He has developed it, this scriptural reasoning for those who seek to go deeper in interfaith dialogue. He actually had 12 uh, what he calls wisdom maxims uh, for those who want to go deeper. And you'll be relieved, I've just put one up for you this evening. And this one is it. Seek wisdom through one's own scripture, history, and theology, and through each other's, and through community practices of interreligious learning. So what is it involved? So scripturing, scriptural reasoning is a process by which different faiths come together to read and reflect on each other's scripture exploring texts and possible interpretations across faith boundaries. It happens in small groups of about eight people uh, who adopt a theme, and that theme could be one like forgiveness or covenant. And <clears throat> with all the uh, scriptures there, maybe three different types of scriptures or three scriptures from different faith communities. There's a short introduction and the passages are read and a discussion follows. Now it's not about agreement, but it's about a form of deeper learning and understanding one another. One person described the process in this way. It helps me dig deeper into my own tradition, often provoked by the inquiries of others. I go back and read more deeply about how and why I understand texts the way I do. It facilitates, facilitates deep reflection of my scripture in a way which doesn't happen when I'm with others of my own faith, because we take so many things for granted. And this is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, isn't it? It's people not like us that makes us grow. Now, I understand that there are groups in Kent, in North Kent, um, which do practice and engage with scriptural reasoning. In North Kent, there's one group uh, of Jews, Christians, and Muslims who are engaged in this. And in the Gravesend area, there is a small group of Sikh and Christians who are actually engaged in this scriptural reasoning. But it's an international practice now, and I understand that even in China, um, that, they, that they do this. So these are the contexts for dialogue and for action. But what about some of the challenges when you engage in interfaith work? I'm just going to mention three, but maybe you will have others to raise in the questions. 
One of them is a fear of offending others, of perhaps not knowing much about a religion and being fearful of showing a lack of knowledge and a lack of respect. Well, actually, if you lack knowledge about a religion, an interfaith group is just the place to be. It's, um, you, you can openly admit that you know nothing, you just need to ask that question, and it's an opportunity to learn from others, and that is the whole point of interfaith dialogue. You might have to develop the skills of asking questions without being confrontational um, or, or challenging. But that's important. Most people like to be asked and to talk about their faith. The second is about not being practiced in talking about religion as an interesting topic for discussion whether you are a believer or you are a non-believer. And I think this is cultural, because I think religion, it used to be said that at dinner parties that you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion, and I think we've built on that practice. Um, some years ago, when I went to India for the first time, and I tr did a lot of traveling on trains, um, if you were sitting opposite an Indian couple or a family, they began talking about religion. And they assumed that as you came from London, then you must be Christian. Um, but they, they then talked about it. It wasn't just a matter of giving you a label. You know, we're Hindu, you must be Christian. It was actually wanting to engage in dialogue, in saying, well, what do you believe? And learning from each other. And I think that, uh, well, I'm certainly not suggesting that next time you get the 1036, the St. Pancras, that you set up a discussion about religion. But I think that's very different from not being able to talk about it as a fascinating subject. The third area is, I think, really important. Because interfaith dialogue can take courage. And the courage is concerned with the courage to give up one's stereotypical image of faiths and people. It's very easy to glean images from biased media coverage or snippets of half-told facts. You know, and to think Hinduism is about this and all Hindus or Jews see themselves as or Muslims are. But when you actually meet Hindus, Jews, Muslims face to face, that meeting is an encounter, an encounter with real people. And you can no longer hold on to these stereotypical versions that you may have in your head. So, interfaith dialogue, and I'm coming to a close. I don't know whether the place, Broadwater Farm, rings any bells for you. It's in Tottenham in the London borough of Haringey. It's an area with different cultures and religions, but sadly, it's often remembered for the frightening violence of the past. Some years ago, I had a national education project running, and Haringey wanted to be involved, involved in the part of the project which was about strengthening a sense of community by establishing links between schools and local places of worship. Now, the places of worship that were chosen was the newly built, at the time, mosque, and also the Greek Orthodox Church. And the schools that were selected for the project were those around the Broadwater Farm Estate. 
preachers went to the different places of worship and members from the different places of worship visited the schools and so on. And there was a lot of interaction. And then it was time for the children or the pupils to go and to visit these places of worship. And I accompanied Broadwater Farm Primary School on their visit to this very beautiful Turkish mosque. Now the Imam was a young man and he had a lovely way with these very young children of about six years old. And he was talking about the tiling of the mosque, the beautiful blue and the green and the white. And he compared the different colors and patterns to the different communities living in Haringey. And as he was talking, he suddenly noticed that one of the young boys was someone who came to that mosque at the weekend with his parents. And his dad was a parent helper. And he said to, called across to his son and said, show everyone what you do when you come to the mosque at the weekend. And so this little tot of about six came up in front of everyone and showed how he prayed the different prayer positions and said some of the words that he said. Now, the teachers and also the rest of the class were gobsmacked because this little boy was not the brightest and the best in the class. He was very shy, very retiring. And yet here he was sharing an important part of his home life with his teachers and his classmates. A rather different experience from the German experience I'd mentioned earlier. After the, this, the children went on to copy patterns of the tiles and they copied some of the Arabic writing. And when they were doing this, one of the mums, who was a West Indian and attended the local Pentecostal church, approached the Imam and she said to him, when you pray to Allah, is it the same God that I pray to when I'm in church? Now, you don't ask that question if you think you're going to be ignored. You don't ask that question if you think you're going to be mocked or disregarded. But this question is the beginning of God talk. It's the beginning of theology. And remembering those words of Hans Kung at the beginning, perhaps this dialogue between Christian and Muslim, or similar dialogues between Sikh and Hindu, Christian and Jew, should be a significant part of contemporary theology in the third millennium. Thank you for this talk. It's uh, really fascinating. Um, I just have a sort of question because um, because I have noticed, you know, your focus really primarily about the UK and like the interface dialogue is not just something that happens here and doesn't happen in Germany. It doesn't mean that's how you portrayed it here, but this must be happening in all of all places around the world. And I just wonder whether you have anything to say about 
what happens in other places, you know, other um, countries around the world, and I'm sure the UK is not the only country in the world that does so well at this, or at least that's how you had portrayed it. So I would like to sort of hear a little bit more of an international view on this. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it, and I've come adrift. <laughs> yeah, because it's portraying the UK as being, you know, doing this all well, and other countries like Germany portrayed as this country where they don't do well. So I'm sure there's a bit more there's a bit more to it. This is an international phenomenon. There must be other countries exploring in a similar way these challenges of interfaith dialogue. Um, yes, I, I mean, I can't answer across all the European countries at all because um, I haven't had recent contact with them. But certainly, um, that area of Germany, it was around Stuttgart, um, and there was a, a quite a considerable concern amongst the churches that this should happen. And I think that probably that it did spread, but I can't give you any figures on, on, on what has happened since. I mean, I can tell you what happened at the time after that conference, um, that, uh, that there was a short-term and a long-term um, uh, proposal for action. The short-term one is at the conference, they had included a filmmaker a Euro who was European, and he was very well known across Europe um, for working in deprived communities, making films and invo involving um, pupils in schools, but also members of the local communities to build a, a sense of community. So that was the short-term action as a result of that co um, conference. But also there was a longer-term one um, of building some of the suggestions of what happened here in Britain into the German context. Um, and I know that there are various other, there are quite strong links with people in Cologne um, and in other parts of Germany, in other uni university cities in Germany, um, looking at different faiths. Um, there are various organizations here, SHAP, for example, there's a European SHAP. Um, and I've been to those conferences, and then there are other organizations through education which are looking at this interfaith issues. Great. I just wonder what the Imam answered. Sorry? I wonder what the Imam answered. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. You know, it seemed a very sensitive conversation, and I was standing quite near them, and I moved away. Um, so I didn't actually hear the follow-up there. It seemed intrusive to stand. Mm. That was a really interesting talk and um, particularly to have a little bit of information about some of the different ways in which um, dialogue is facilitated. And in describing that, one thing that really struck me is that even though the focus might be different faith groups coming together, there's also an interweaving of other things around language and culture. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts or reflections about some of those sort of overlaps or intersections between different faith communities and also cultural and language um, differences as well. Thank you. 
Um, yes. Uh, well, can I start from a different perspective and say that in some of those activities, like the scriptural reasoning, that has many different contexts, and it could well be something that takes place within an individual faith community. So it could well be something that took place amongst Christians, for example. And I just wonder, if that did happen, whether there would be as much controversy as there might between different faith traditions. And I think it's important to recognize that um, I've talked about different faith communities, but differences within each tradition are as many as there are between faiths. Um, and so I don't think you can necessarily assume that because you have two different faiths talking, that it's going to be hugely different from two different denominations, Christian denominations talking. Um, in terms of the use of language, um, I'm not quite sure what you meant by it, but um, if you look at what hap is happening across England, across Britain now, there is a lot of di interfaith dialogue going on. And I think people are used to the context of getting together and talking. There may be differences in terminology, but those differences are actually starting points for discussion. They're very positive ones. And, and I think we always have to check out what do you mean? What kind of word should I be using to describe it? We had a, a Candifer meeting just about a week ago, and I, I did that myself to check out which was a good word to use to describe an action. Um, also, we tend to think of religion as being, each religion as being very fixed, but of course they're not at all. Um, they are, it, religion is dynamic. I mean, there, would, well, there was a time when we certainly wouldn't have been sitting here in a Methodist church. Um, and, you know, in liberal Judaism is just celebrating its 31st year. The reform movement of Judaism is a bit earlier. People talk about Hinduism and go to the Swami Narayan temple in Neesden and say, oh, we've looked at, you know, Hinduism. When in fact that movement probably dates from about the 60s, 1960s. So religions are dynamic and it's changing. Um, I don't know if you're watching the pilgrimage series that's on at the moment. Um, and one of the people on this pilgrimage is Monty Panasar, the cricketer. And I've heard in the past, through lots of visits to lots of Gurdwaras, Sikh temples, Sikhs talking about their beliefs. And when I heard Monty Panasar in that first episode, I'd never heard Sikhs talk about their belief in that way. Um, so I rang a friend um, who is an expert in Sikhism, and she was saying how there is a different interpretation of the Mool Man, of the uh, Japji, which is the equivalent of a, a kind of creed, if you like. Um, which I had heard many years ago, the opening lines being, there is one God. And she said, now people are, set, are translating, Sikhs are translating it as, all is one. And so, this, and this is what Monty Panasar was saying. So, in terms of language and terminology, it's changing. It changes all the time. And I think, you know, the, in interfaith groups, as I said earlier, it's a start um, for discussion and debate. Mm. 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 And of course, we're talking about many people who are sort of third generation now. So in fact, you know, English as a 
as a language for communication is common. Thank you. Uh, just a word, a uh, question about action. Well, not a question. It's, it's, a, it's a thought I, I've had ever since I watched the Archbishop of Canterbury on Sunday um, in his sermon. And you mentioned about the Holocaust and how um, when we had that service and there were Christians, there was Muslims, and there were Jews there, and it was so powerful. And I couldn't help thinking... If only on that on Easter Sunday, there could have been an interfaith response um, to Rwanda. How wonderful that would have been! And, and I and I wondered if there could be a kind of godly religious cobra when there's a crisis in government. They have a cobra meeting. Well, perhaps we could have something similar, so that when there was a national crisis. They press a button and all get together, you know, all the different faiths, and respond to this crisis. And with a bit of luck, the response might be very much the same. And that would be so powerful if, if that could be the case. Because um, Britain is not just a Christian country at all, and getting less and less so. Um, when Prince Charles becomes king, he wants to be king of faith, not just of the Christian faith. And I just had that thought that it would have been wonderful if on that, you know, as a response to Rwanda, it could have been a multi-faith response and not just a Christian one. Just a thought. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, I think when it comes to, I, I have heard that when it comes to the situation in Ukraine and the Russian situation um, with the primate of the Orthodox uh, Church in Russia, who has been so controversial, I think Rowan Williams has gone and attended. Now, is it the World Council of Faiths or World Religions of Faiths, is it? Yes, and, and has uh, spoken at that um, and to try and effect some change and to raise the question of the, his position in the light of what has gone on. Yes, just to say that um, this sort of religious cobra. I've never heard it called that before. <laughs> but, but it often happens. You know, at times of crisis, the leaders of the faith do get together. And, and we've done it here in Canterbury too, in, in the past. So it's, it's not an uncommon thing. Yes, it wouldn't surprise me if they'd actually done it, but it hasn't hit the headlines quite yet. They're too busy with parties and things. <laughs> When, you, when uh, Stacy was asking about language, and you were talking about language, um, it, um, it made me think of it slightly differently. So um, I was thinking of language and culture, especially with first generation people. Um, sometimes um, religion and culture is very, um, is very intertwined and having been in a church where there were a large number of people from India, a particular part of India, who were Christian, but who shared I mean, much more culturally um, with their Sikh neighbors than they did with us, as it were, in the church as Christians. So, so interfaith dialogue in that kind of setting is, has got a <laughs> sort of tricky bits to it. Um, and I, you know, that it isn't the same everywhere, but that, that was what occurred to me when we were just talking about language and it goes over into culture. 
and the, the different um, approaches that you have culturally to talking about things. Yes, I mean, I think one of the things that goes by the board often is that Christianity is a multicultural religion. And there are huge differences in terms of, of culture um, <clears throat> within the Christian tradition. Um, I, I, a, a close colleague of mine died about a year ago, and his widow organized his, uh, his uh, ceremony, the, the funeral. And they were both Roman Catholics. In fact, they had been in holy orders. Um, but her concern was that the Irish contingent who came over for the funeral um, might not have approved for the funeral that she organized because the Irish way of doing it was so very different from the, the English uh, way of doing this. So I think, the, you know, focusing on that and then you get um, the Indian Roman Catholic tradition. And of course, that, that's quite an exciting area, really, because you've got Father Bede Griffiths, who, a Benedictine, who went to India um, to study Hinduism and Hindu theology, the Vedanta, um, and wrote that amazing book, The Marriage of East and West, and said that when he went to India, he discovered the other part of his soul. Um, and then there are others, like another Benedictine, Klaus Klostermeyer, who also went to India um, to explore um, Catholic and uh, Indian Hindu dialogue. Um, so it, there are sort of long traditions of Christian in different cultural settings. And that is important. About the older generation, I think those come through with like the story um, of the, the case that I mentioned about uh, organizing a funeral between the Irish and, and the British Catholics as well. But it will occur in other ways. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I was, um, I suppose I was waiting all the way through your talk for, your, for the last line, which um, was obviously a very good last line, where, um, or the last comment about um, the question that was posed, um, is, is the God you worship to the God I worship? Um, or something like that was said. Um, which I think is the fundamental, um, and not being a theologian, I don't know what the answer would be, I wondered if anyone in the hall here today, I'm not putting you entirely on the spot, but someone would like to offer an answer to it. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> see, see what I can come up with here. <laughs> um, I think that from the, the starting point of the Bible and the revelation in the Bible, um, God has revealed himself to all peoples uh, through the natural created order. So St. Paul tells us, and is so, so is so clear in, in the Old Testament as well. So there's general revelation and, and, and common grace whereby a God of love um, makes his grace and his he, he, he reveals himself through the created order that he's made, but also through an outpouring of his grace. But St. Paul would then go on, in, in the, of course, to say that, there's, um, that Jesus Christ is the one who came into the world to, to bring about the salvation of, of, um, of us, and that uh, through the, the death of Jesus Christ on, on the cross, uh, forgiveness and uh, the victory over sin and suffering and death itself um, has been overcome for all peoples of all times, but not all peoples have yet had the opportunity to hear that good news. Am I supposed to be asking a question? No, no, no. I think I'm. Sp I've been invited. We have been invited to say, um, answer a question. I do indeed. 
I'll have a go at moving in that direction. So I, I think there's the answer to the question about um, is God is is there simply one God who's who, in, in for the for all faiths to whom we're all actually looking? The answer I would say is yes, but God has revealed Himself unequivocally and fully in the face of Jesus Christ would be a Christian point of view. So um, my, my question to you, thank you so much for opening out all the issues of uh, interfaith dialogue. My question would be, um, what about people who say they have no faith and how do we dialogue with them? Because that's a very large part of our community. Um, yes, it is that the people without a faith tradition, they are a large part of the community. I think, in fact, it's almost half of those who have affirmed as Christians in the 2011 census. I, I have the figures here with me. Um, but it depends. Uh, I would want to go back to the comment that I made about finding religion an interesting topic and challenging topic for discussion, whether you are a believer or if you are not. And I think that would be a, a, a starting point. And then the question is, people may not be of a faith tradition, but there are many shared values. And so it's not only about belief, it's about lifestyle and practice. And the, those things that we hold in common are, well, I don't want to say this, but they are probably greater than those things that divide us. And I, I will say that. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I couldn't be held number by number on that one. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I was just wondering what you would say, given that religious education in schools is of this diverse nature, and that we've moved beyond um, instruction intended to convert to uh, thinking about how religions answer the big questions of life. Given that children are exposed to this type of critical thinking in school, um, do you think that bodes well for dialogue in the future, or do you think it sort of wears off? Because there, isn't, there don't seem to be adult channels, many adult channels, apart from, you know, Candifer and, and things like that, for this to go on. I just wondered if you have any reflections on, on the efficacy of religious education. <laughs> well, well, where do you begin with that? I mean, s certainly, um, religious education is not about indoctrination. It's not about nurturing in individual faith, except in church schools where there may be an element of that. Um, it, it is about education, and we do have agreed syllabuses which are developed um, by educationalists, by, but also by members of individual faith communities who come together under the title of the SACRE, the Standing Advisory Council for Religious Education, to agree the local syllabus for teaching. And so all of the faith communities come together and have some input in developing that syllabus. And some of it will be about educating within the religion. And also, some of it will be about offering a religious perspective on those key questions in life. You know, why am I here? What's it all about? Those questions you ask yourself as you fall out of bed on a Monday morning. Um, you, and... <clears throat> Yes, so hopefully it should be a balance of, of those things. The question about how, um, it, how effective it is in that in between years of sort of adolescence and late adolescence, well, I think that is dependent on college and universities. I think there's, there, uh, 
Candifer took part a few years ago in a forum up at the Kent University um, and talking about different religious perspectives. And actually, there was a surprising number of students present who had turned up for that. And afterwards, there were a large number of students who were very interested in Candifer. They hadn't known that there was an interfaith group present in Canterbury. So hopefully, that is an area to be developed. Um, in terms of across the faith traditions, I think it's um, quite common, really, for people, for, for young people in faith traditions to sort of drop off during that period of late adolescence. I remember taking a group of students, it was when I was working here, um, to a Gurdwara, and one of the students asked the person who was speaking to us and saying, you know, do you hold on to your young people? And he said, well, no, not when they're adolescent, but then when they become older, if they get married, have children of their own, they come back into a, a, a faith a perspective. Um, I think there is a lot of interest in issues. There will be uh, issues of war relationships, um, and that will, those will be on the syllabuses for for students, so hopefully, um, for, for people in schools, uh, rather, and hopefully that will be something which will challenge their thinking about the role of religion in personal and public life. Have I answered that question at all? <laughs> I wanted to raise something about the challenges of interfaith dialogue. And I don't know quite how to articulate this, but um, a few weeks ago, the local mosque held an open day. Um, and they were hugely hospitable. There was food. Um, we had the opportunity to, to watch um, the midday prayers and they were very welcoming to us and it was they had an exhibition which was focusing on Jesus and Mary and I read all the information that they put up which was very largely material from the Quran and I was quite taken back by my own reaction because to my shame, I don't think I'd read what the Quran said about Jesus and Mary before, although I had a few vague ideas. And I was really quite disturbed by it. And I suppose in the spirit of interfaith dialogue, the thing to have done would have been to talk, try and talk it through with someone. Um, I have to say I chickened out and um, just sort of felt my discomfort myself, but I don't think I have problems talking about God with people of other faiths, and I can feel quite a lot of commonality there, but when you come to things like different scriptures, I was suddenly aware of a whole lot of different interpretations and assumptions and I didn't really know how, how to deal with it, and so I didn't deal with it. Um, could you comment, please? <laughs> I'll try. Um, yes, I was also at the mosque on that uh, Sunday, and I think, and, and I can take your point about some of the text that was up. Um, it was very specifically Muslim, um, and why wouldn't it be in a mosque? Um, but there were differences and significant differences from, say, the teaching about Mary in Christianity. Um, uh, yes, in Christianity. Now, the difficulty, I think, on that occasion was that it was a, a social occasion. It was welcoming um, different people to see a place of worship. And as such, it did a good job, 
But what it needed to happen after that is for discussion and debate on some of those hard issues of difference. Now, in theory, um, interfaith dialogue doesn't stop at those soft, easy areas of agreement. It is supposed to look at challenging issues, that real hard edge of difference, but maintaining respect for that difference. Um, but I don't think you can do those two things in the one situation that actually you needed to come away and to have a smaller group, just as you would have with the spiritual, uh, scriptural reasoning, to talk about some of those differences quite uh, specifically. Um, it's also going to affect, it, it's going to affect the timing and also the, the the bonds that are built within the uh, that are, are found within the interfaith group, because to actually raise those questions of real strong difference and to be able to talk about them openly, there really needs to be a very strong bond of trust between those raising the questions of difference and actually being able to talk about them. Sorry? I'm, 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 I'm the exact person you're talking about. Are you? Uh, yes, I am. In what uh, way? Uh, that's, the, that's the hope. That's the encouragement. Mm. That's the, you know, through, through, through the power of God. Mm. That's the encouragement. Mm. I think that's what people are trying to, you know, to work at. Well, I'm not a problem. Uh, but, but, oh. I'm, the, I'm the person she's talking about. So can I just ask you, are we addressing the hope? Are we talking about the sort of hope that you're wanting? In your way. Mm. In your way. Yeah. But the problem for me, and I'm sorry that everyone here, you know, I'm more vocal than I'm a person. Mm. No, I'm not threatening you. No. No, I'm giving you God. Okay. So, so the thing you're talking about, I'm a person. Mm. So, mm. And I'm going to tell you, mm. That sounds tough. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It's, it's okay. We can we can hear. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. We can hear. That's all right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think I think actually I just was just finishing that talking about um, about needing to be in small groups to talk about some things, and and that was the point that I was making earlier on. Are you happy with that? To leave it at that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so I think then um, you want to draw it to a close, Rosemary. Yes, I think we do. Okay. I'm going to hand over to uh, Richard, Rick Norman, for the vote of thanks. I have been asked to tell you before this happens about the next meeting on the 18th of May, which is Barbara Glasson, Peace is a Doing Word. And Barbara Glasson um, was the president of the Methodist Conference and I understand actually grew up in this church. So you're getting a message about that. And now I'll ask Rick to give a vote of thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to do so. Um, on your behalf, to thank Lynn for her, for her talk this evening. Um, 
In introducing her, Rosemary talked about uh, Lynn's combination of skills, both a very impressive academic work, but also putting that into practice by providing resources for, for education and so forth. And I think we've, we, we've been particularly aware this evening of that combination of skills. Um, Lynn herself referred to the idea that interfaith dialogue is about bringing people together and as she said that's not just a textbook thing that's about bringing real people together in real situations through the real practical work um, and we've we've heard from lynn how she herself has guided that work locally in the work of candifer as she mentioned she took over the the chairing of candifer the local interfaith group from uh, mike walling here who's the proverbial hard act to follow but as a, a member of um, Candifer and a member of Candifer Council have been hugely impressed with the way in which Lynn has taken that work forward. And she's mentioned this evening uh, some of the activities that that has involved, the art exhibitions and the chanting and the, um, <coughs> the outdoor activities, um, the contributions to the local community. If I could just highlight one of those, she mentioned the um, Hare Krishna dancing behind the bullock cart, and I have to say I was hugely impressed with Lynn's own skills on that occasion, her own dancing skills. But that's just one example of, of the way in which she's put those, the, the idea of interfaith dialogue into practice within our local community here. And as I say, as a member of Candifer, I've been hugely impressed with the way in which she's coordinated that work for us and guided it uh, and taken it forward. Uh, and it's been a, a pleasure this evening to hear about the thinking that lies behind that. Lynn has demonstrated her own wide and deep knowledge of different religious traditions, and she's shared with us the vision that lies behind the work of interfaith work, the, the Jonathan, Jonathan Sachs vision of working together and bringing, building a community and people working side by side and face to face. Um, and if I may, on your behalf then, thank Lynn very much for sharing that vision with us this evening and thank her also for all the work that she does locally in putting that vision into practice. Thank you very much, Lynn. <laughs>